So I wanted to tell you uh, the birth of my passion because it's, if you buy my book, there's a section there called The Birth of My Passion. And at, way back when, when I was 28 years old, I had two little kids. I now have three sons, but at that time I had two sons. And my five-year-old had chronic ear infections with bronchitis. And I went through more pediatricians than I'd like to count, probably at least five. And all they wanted to do is write another prescription for more antibiotics. I also, at the same time, had a one-and-a-half-year-old who suffered with eczema for about six months, which I also had when I was little. And I had ear infections and bronchitis and eczema and some other things as well. And all they wanted to do for him is put hydrocortisone cream on his skin. And I didn't want to do that either. At the same time, I had an ovarian cyst the size of a lemon, and they wanted to take a surgery and take my ovary out. I was 28, and I wasn't quite sure I was finished having my family. So in frustration, I started looking. And I think it's a Zen saying, I'm not sure, but I heard one time that when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. And somebody gave me a book. You know how sometimes you're really looking for an answer? Why am I? <laughs> you're looking for an answer and somebody hands you a book and somehow or other there's something in there. And it alluded to the possibility it could be dairy. So I thought, well, I'll try half a, a month. I'll take the kids off of all dairy food whatsoever and see what happens. And in two weeks, that eczema cleared up and went away. Aaron's colds never came back. He never got an ear infection again. They went through the entire high school years without even getting a cold or the flu. My youngest son then came, this was at oops at 40. Would you imagine it would be an oops? <laughs> but at 40 years old, I went on to have my third son. And I thought, you know, I've been doing this for 11 years, raising kids without dairy food, not without calcium. They got tons of calcium in their diet. So that threw me into studying nutrition so I knew enough how to replace that calcium in their diet. So with Matthew, my youngest, I ended up raising him without dairy food as well, and he never got sick in high school. Not one day, not as a toddler, not as a preschooler, not in elementary or high school. Not a cold, not flu, nothing. So fast forward, uh, he's 25, I'm 65, and I'm still <laughs> spreading the news, <laughs> spreading the passion I have about eating healthy. I shop at farmer's market, you have a wonderful, and I noticed growing farmer's market in, on Thursdays, it used to be very small when I used to come, it is quite big, um, buy your produce there. Most of the produce that you're gonna get at the grocery stores, even the expensive health food stores, is probably at least five days to a week old. So if you get it home in a few days in the refrigerator, it starts, starts to spoil on you. The reason is it's already been picked quite a while ago. So buy local, buy fresh, and support your local merchants. So this morning what I want to do, um, we've already done the recipes. I'm going to do a, a talk about the recipes I did. But I would like to, what I'm going to do in seven, 45 minutes is condense all that I have learned um, in 20 years, 30 years, of cooking the little tips and tricks so that you can go home and actually use this in the kitchen right away. I'm gonna start with knife skills. And I must tell you, um, I forgot to mention, the ovarian cyst, it dissolved. I never had surgery. Uh, my father died of cancer when he was only 47 years old. So 20 years later on, several years ago, I find myself working in an alternative cancer clinic here in Santa Barbara, which is my, my payback to uh, help other people. So let's get uh, into some of the techniques we want. Oh, yeah, it's here. <clears throat> Just plug it in. Hope this light helps. I know this is... Uh... Okay. Yes? Helps a little bit? Is this okay? Okay. All right. So what I want to talk to you first about is boards and knives. You do not want to use a ceramic. You don't want to use acrylic. You don't want to use marble, good heavens, glass, or your countertop. You could spend $200 on a knife and kill it probably within an hour if you use a hard surface. Knives are supposed to be cut on surfaces where the surfaces give to the knife. So that means the, the knife will actually cut into the surface and that would be the wood surface. So wood surfaces are very, uh, they're very healthy. You don't have to worry about bacteria, but you do have to clean them. So about once a month, I'd either put some uh, bleach and water combination on it or some straight lemon, straight vinegar, and scrub it. And you're going to scrub off a lot of the bacteria. Let it sit overnight on the counter and let it air dry. Then take some spraying oil, not 
Pam, whatever oil that you put in your body, you don't even have to have spraying oil, just even olive oil, and rub it into the wood, both sides, if it's a board that doesn't have feet on it, and let that air dry. And what'll happen is the board pulls the, water, the oil in, and the oil acts like a buffer to the water. The water from the vegetables the next time you cut will come down into the fibers of the wood, but it won't go any deeper because the oil has acted like a little shield, like a little buffer. So every periodically want to clean it. If you take care of your boards, you can have boards last 10, 15 years. I have some boards even older than that. Uh, with knives, this, this style of knife that I'm showing you here is called the Santuco, S-A-N-T-O-K-U. You can spend $30 in buying a Santuco or you could spend $100, doesn't matter, but get that style of knife. The reason for it is that chefs, when they cut, they don't do this kind of cutting toward themselves and we don't cut away from ourselves by picking up the knife. We anchor the knife on the board and we cut with only the back part of the knife, which I'll demonstrate for you, like this. And you can't do that if you've got a skinny knife with a blade that's too narrow because your knuckles will hit the board. So you have to have a blade thick enough in the back. So those of you who have chef knives, they're fine, they usually work. The, the width in the back is good. I find with chef knives though, most of them are nine inches long and they're too long. They kind of get in the way. Better to have maybe a seven inch blade. So these are seven inch. You can get a Cuisinart at Bed Bath & Beyond for $30. It's a great bargain. Or you can spend a couple hundred dollars. As This was a gift from my son. My son is a, uh, you know, sometimes you never know how your kids are gonna turn out. My, this oldest, none of the boys were in the kitchen actually when they were growing up just to come and eat. But my oldest ended up getting interested in cooking and food. Um, he went to the Cushy Institute back east and he's now Eddie Murphy's chef. He's been Eddie Murphy's chef for more than 10 years. So he gave me this knife as a gift one year and I love it. It's a global knife. It's beautifully balanced. It's a hollow handle and I could cut with it for hours and not tire my wrist. However, it's a Japanese blade or honed at a different angle, a much sharper angle than an American blade. So if you sharpen it on an electric sharpener, as I did, not knowing that years ago, I dulled the blade. And I have since had it professionally sharpened. It's still not as good as it used to be. So I actually changed the edge of the knife. So just a fair warning if you buy a Japanese blade. The Henkels and all the German, they're all done to American standards. The only ones are not would be the Japanese. Okay, and these dimples, these are just dimples here. These dimples help when you're cutting for the vegetables to kind of fall off the knife. Otherwise, they kind of stick. Do you have vegetables flying all over the board? This is what the dimples are for, okay? So I'm gonna show you the quinoa salad. Mary, could you bring me my water? Oh, okay, thanks. Didn't realize I should have taken. So quinoa, how many of you cook with quinoa? I love this grain. Quinoa is a whole grain, the same uh, category as brown rice and barley and oats. Even corn is a whole grain. I'm not talking about corn flakes or corn tortillas, I'm talking about the whole grain corn. Wild rice, uh, there's other grains that you may not, not be familiar with. Spelt, kumut, amaranth, and teff, these are all whole grains. Most common though is the quinoa and brown rice. Quinoa is a light, fluffy grain that takes 18 minutes to cook, it's fantastic. Brown rice can take close to an hour. The, the, even the package, they're gonna tell you to put the quinoa in the pot of water. It's two to one, by the way, two cups of water to one cup of quinoa. They're gonna tell you to put the quinoa in at the same time in the cold water and bring them both up to the boil. Don't do that. Because if you want to lighten a fluffy, quin fluffy quinoa, get your water that's measured boiling first. Take your quinoa, one cup, if it's, you're doing one to two, and strain it and then put it in the boiling water, a little bit of salt, put a lid, 18 minutes, it's done. Then it separates really well to make a pilaf or a salad. Otherwise it comes a little bit dense. So after you do the quinoa, I turn the quinoa into so many different dishes at home. This California Fiesta quinoa salad will have black beans in it. It will have uh, kalamata olives in it, cucumbers, celery, uh, scallions, tomatoes, cilantro, uh, did I say corn? A little bit of hot red pepper flakes, but we made sure that we kept it mild today. 
what we have in here is fresh corn that was donated, who I don't know, but somebody donated fresh corn. Uh, and the tomatoes and many of the things were donated for this. So I want to show you how I want you to prep a tomato for something like this. When you're doing tomato for salad, you really don't want to do the tomato in wedges because then it's hard to get it in cubes. You want tiny little cubes of the tomato. So you actually, what you want to do is slabs straight across the tomato like this. Then there's always in the corner pockets that seed. Can you see? Is this a good angle? OK. So just take your thumb and push out those seeds. The reason for it, these seeds and that, that part there, although it's very juicy, that's what makes your salads go bad quicker than anything, as well as cucumber seeds. So if I can, in my tomatoes, if I'm going to put it in a salad such as this, I'll push out the seeds. I don't worry so much about the seeds in here. Now you slice it into long stems, if you will, or matchsticks. Now watch my knife. The front of the knife stays on the board, and I pick up the back end of the knife, and I come down. When I hit the board, I do a little bit of a snap with my wrist. And that's the cutting style that you want to use. I'll do it again. I'm going to take this out, of course. Slice it down, slice it down, turn it, come down, down. See, I'm coming back, not trying to cut it backwards. We're so used to, for so many years, we've cut with this kind of motion. I'm asking you to do it differently. And you will cut in a quarter of the time that you used to cut. So much easier. Let's do this. Again, down. You're only coming back to reposition the knife, not to come over it. And the front of the knife stays on the board. By the way, I don't have my, I'm not holding the knife like this. I'm not holding it like this. Don't be afraid of the knife. You want to hold the knife so tight that it's almost like a tennis grip of the knife so that you've got fairly good control of it. I do lift it up a little bit to get it off the board sometimes. But it's this, down, down, down. So always think cutting on a downward stroke. I'm going to put some cilantro in it too. Let me talk to you about herbs for a second. The herbs that I put in here are cilantro. And I put some lots of herbs in things, but cilantro most of this. So there are four herbs that I actually use the stems of the herbs. Because the stems of the herbs are very tender. I'm not talking about the stems down here below the rubber band. I'm talking about the stems that are in there. So when we use these in cooking classes, we take the entire bunch of herbs, put it in a big pot of water or bowl, and swish it, shake it out, swish it again to make sure that all the dirt is out. Cilantro tends to be a little bit dirtier than the rest of the herbs. Then I take this whole herb, and I put it on the board and mince it. And I'll show you how to do that in a second. But let's talk about these here. This is fresh dill. I would still use the top of the fresh dill, but not the bottom. And here's our cilantro. And here's our flat leaf parsley. So just these four, the herb stems are so tender you can cut them and use them in a dish. I'll show you how to store them in a minute. By the way, this is a sponge that we can get, I think it's six to the package, uh, at Trader Joe's. They're one of these cellio sponge, you know they're flat, they come six in a package. Put them in water and it's like sea monsters, they get really big. And I only use this by my boards. Never put soap on a board where you're going to be eating food off of, or uh, cutting food that you're going to be eating. Um, I just leave it in a container with water and we just use that for our boards. So now that this has been really washed, I washed it ahead of time, you roll it up in the board. And again, tuck those fingers. These left hand has got to be tucked like this. When I teach little kids how to use knives, I have them, I tell them it's the claw. Just tuck their fingers like the claw. For us, maybe holding an egg. But these knuckles must be forward of your fingernails. If they're not and you get distracted and you're like this, you're going to cut yourself. I've done it enough that I automatically tuck my fingers now. You'll get used to using your tips of your fingers and the tips of your nails to hold back, uh, uh, to hold underneath. And then you just come down like this.
and I'm walking my fingers backwards as my knife comes toward. Now this is good for at least several more times. Now I juice about four or five mornings a week. And the reason why I juice, not to get off the subject, but we're supposed to be having not five to seven uh, servings of vegetables and fruit a day. We're supposed to be having nine to 11. They've changed that. So nine to 11, each serving, by the way, is a half a cup and a half a cup of servings. And by the way, your lettuce doesn't count. So if it's a set, because it's all water, it's really all water mostly. But the, veg, the other vegetables in there are salad would count, the tomatoes, carrots, radishes, whatever you put in it. So that would mean at least four cups of vegetables a day. For some people, that's a lot. I have vegetables even for breakfast. This morning I had a couple of soft boiled eggs with a half an avocado and a fresh tomato and some balsamic vinegar on top of that. And if I had fresh basil, if the basil was here, I had left it here. Fresh basil, I would have put that in there. It's just delicious. Sometimes I'll have a vegetable omelet. But the point is, I put vegetables in my diet every chance I get because they're high in antioxidants and vitamins and minerals, many of which protect us against cancer and, and many other diseases as well. So we're going to put this, and I'll show you how to preserve that. But this should be nice and minced. And what I was saying is that I use the bottom of this in my juicer, all that stem that I wouldn't normally use in something else. Okay, so while we'll get back to this in a second. I want to talk to you, finish to you, talking about the herbs. So how do you preserve these? These four herbs and these four herbs only love being in the refrigerator. They're fine being in the refrigerator. But if you don't cover them, they will burn. They'll get freezer burn on them and they dry out. So just take a bag that you have from the grocery store and cover it like this. It's got water in it. And this will be good for 10 days to almost two weeks. And they'll be as fresh as they are the day that you buy them. Um, I've lately been buying my herbs at the farmer's market. I have this guy down in Ventura that, um, by the way, I'm, I'm an out of towner. I'm from Ventura. <laughs> but I love Carpinteria. We, George and I, once in a while, I have to tell you this because uh, it's just a sweet thing. Um, the traffic is horrible going home. It really is. And on Fridays, it's even worse. So George is expecting a call almost every Friday night. I'll meet you in carp. <laughs> we just have to pull off. And Zucker's is one of our favorite because it's an easy pull off. And I just have a simple meal that, and we get to miss the traffic. So carpentry is my dinner destination sometimes. Um, but anyway, this is how you do it. And it's good for almost two weeks. Some other herbs are not so great in the refrigerator, um, one of which is basil. Basil uh, loves being in water. And you should cover it, but don't put it in the refrigerator. And those of you who've tried to go out and grow basil, as soon as it's a cold snap, it's done. You'll burn it. So keep it in this. When you bring it home, as you do the other herbs, before you put them in there, you know how they're a little brown there? Cut them off a little bit, just like you would ro roses or flowers before you put them in water, and that should preserve longer. Chives can go in water as well, but they should be refrigerated. I didn't have room in there. Uh, we'll talk about this other one in a minute. But also put a, lit, uh, put a plastic bag on top, just, um, just don't refrigerate it. And that should be good for, as well, at least about a week. I've seen it with my basil has already started to grow roots out of the side stems to try to, to re-root again. Okay. All right, so let me diverge here and talk about vinegars because I want to put a vinegar in here. Extra virgin olive oil is super important to put in. We've already put some of this in before it came up. But vinegars I want to talk to you about. This is a vinegar that is um, a unpasteurized raw vinegar. Some of you are familiar with Bragg's apple cider vinegar. This is a health food. This is not just a vinegar, this is a health food. Uh, apple cider vinegar, hers and hers only, is a raw unpasteurized vinegar. What that means is the, the yeast that's used to make the, the vinegar is not killed then through distilling. So Heinz distilled white vinegar has already been pasteurized. So that vinegar can sit on the shelf for 10 years and it's not gonna look any different. If this sits on the shelf for a period of time, this is what happens to it. It gets cloudy. And actually, after the cloudiness comes this sort of stuff on the bottom. 
And you may think that that stuff is an indication that the vinegar has gone bad, and in fact, it's an indication that this is a live food. So this is as good for you, in a sense, as yogurt is. This type of yeast slash bacteria is good for the intestines. It's good to build the, what's called the intestinal flora. For those of you who take yogurt because you know it's good for you, for those of you who take probiotics because it's, you know it's good for you, vinegar is also good for you, and so is pickles, and so is sauerkraut. Of course, unless you have high blood pressure, then I'm not telling you to go have a lot of that. Uh, this company here, Spectrum Naturals, does this beautiful unpasteurized vinegars. Oh, I had it open already. And when I first buy it like this, it's a beautiful red color. And then as it's opened, it starts to turn a little bit brown, and I'll get a little bit of that stuff down at the bottom. So I know it's a raw vinegar. And we also put some hot red pepper flakes in this, which we did later. So let's get back to uh, some of the other things that we're doing. I want to show you about, finish about the herbs. So we have some other herbs here. Oh, by the way, I wanted to show you this. Get a bunch of this and put this on the counter where your uh, cutting boards are. Because if you have the, your wooden cutting board or whatever cutting board acrylic on your counter and you don't have anything to stop it, you could be chopping it slides, you could cut yourself. It'll make the knife slide. So these are, you know, 99 cent store, you can get a roll of these. And they're great for putting underneath. And I cut them and use them for a lot of other things. So let's look at some of these other herbs that are not really good refrigerated herbs. You can refrigerate them for a period of time in a plastic bag. But then when they start to turn on you, you've got to take them out. This is fresh sage. This is thyme. This is oregano. And this is rosemary. So these three, especially, are perfect for just air drying in your kitchen. I have a big basket where I have my tomatoes. Tomatoes are a fruit. They absolutely hate being refrigerated. Did you ever buy fresh fruit at the farmer's market and it was so delicious and you bought a whole bunch and you put it in the refrigerator and the next day you tried it or two days later on and it just wasn't the same? Beyond the ambiance of having it at the farmer's market, the reason why it isn't the same is because sugar changes. The sugar in the fruit changes in cold. It's like the fruit is on the tree and then it's about ready to be sun ripe and then there's a cold snap that comes through. It might even drop the fruit off, but it's going, to, it's going to completely change the sugars in the fruit. That's why tomatoes shouldn't be refrigerated. I never refrigerate tomatoes, not cherries, nothing. If I've used half of the tomato, I eat the rest. Because I'm not going to eat it the next day. It's going to be mealy and mushy, and it's going to take like those, those winterized ones. Now, I've bought tomatoes in the dead of winter at the health food stores and know that they come out of the walk-in box, which is a walk-in refrigerator, with to the boxes of tomatoes. So in transit, many times they are refrigerating tomatoes. So if you're still disappointed in tomatoes and you're buying them at the health food store or someplace else, it's because they have been refrigerated. When you buy local, they, they're usually picking it that morning and you're buying it this afternoon. So this big, beautiful basket I have is just straw. Um, it's not a narrow basket, so the tomatoes are not on top of each other. They're just laid out single layer. And I'll put this, these three herbs right in that basket after I've used a bit and they're starting to turn on me. And what happens in about two weeks, they completely dry up without going black. They stay green. And then, let's say, I do, unfortunately, I didn't have any to show you, but let's say, for instance, this beautiful thyme is nice, crispy dry. I'll take a piece of paper and I'll take these herbs and I'll just rub them with my fingers and the dry herb falls off the stem. And I take that paper, and I fold it, and I pour it back in my spice jar, in the herb jar. Is it because I'm cheap? No. The most expensive thing per pound that I buy and all that I do, catering and cooking classes and private chef work, is my spices and my herbs. So if I'm going to buy this my farmer today, I spent a dollar. He charges me a dollar for this. this. This is worth at least a jar and a half of fresh sage. So why not dry it up and use it? I can't do that with a lot of herbs, but I can do it with that. If you don't want to bother doing that, another way to do it is to, and by the way, how you take this off is you hold it up at top and you just strip it. <laughs> it's really fresh, so it's going to break. If it breaks at the top, that's okay. This is woody, 
this is woody, this is woody, and that's the reason why they don't like being in water. They don't, they're not going to take up the water, so why bother putting them in water? You could strip the herb off, chop it up, put it in a Ziploc bag, and freeze it. Or you can put it in your ice cube tray, put a little water in the ice cube tray, and freeze the cubes with a fresh herb in it. That'll help prevent it from blackening. If you just put chopped parsley in a Ziploc bag in the freezer, it will black, blacken. If you put it in an ice cube and you put it in the freezer, it will not blacken. You still won't be able to use it as a fresh herb, but it will definitely um, preserve the color. Okay? Those are those three. Oregano is wonderful. This is another one, too. Oops. Again, strip it back and just mince it up. Uh, this is mint. I adore mint. I do put mint in my juice. Just about three mornings a week, and I get this green, I imagine it's a green julep or it's mint julep, but it's, it's got kale in it and cucumbers, but it's got mint in it. So I just strip it back to, I do not put the stems in my juicer. I've learned that the oil in the stems is way too strong and almost too bitter. But this is fresh mint and also delicious to, to put in almost anything you want to put in. And we'll do some garlic in a minute. Marianne, yeah. could you come here? Marianne has been my assistant for, talk about volunteers. I think sometimes I cook for a village. Uh, this week alone, I think I've prepared food for close to, well, now, now it's over that. <laughs> Probably 200 this week. And Marianne has been a volunteer and a helper of mine for so many years, and I wanted to acknowledge her and ask her to do me a favor. <laughs> uh, I forgot what I wanted you to do. Oh, <laughs> would you take um, like a sprig each and give each table a sprig so they can smell the fresh herbs? Yeah, it's amazing, huh? You know rosemary. We grow rosemary all over. Yeah, we grow rosemary everywhere. They may have plates in the kitchen if you want to use plates. I love fresh herbs. Oh, by the way, if a recipe calls for dried herbs and you have fresh and you want exchange for fresh, what you do, this is a rule of thumb, is three. You do three times. You increase by three times because the fresh herb has a lot of water in it, so you can have a whole lot more than the dry version. The dry version is more concentrated in oils and flavor. Likewise, if a recipe calls for fresh herbs, let's say it's a tablespoon of fresh herbs, chopped, minced or something, and you ha only have dried in the house, then you go down by a third. So down by a third, up by three, depending on what direction you're going on exchanging, okay? Cucumbers, I wanted to, oh. Cucumbers were also in the quinoa salad. I love these great little cucumbers. But I wanted to tell you something about cucumbers, whether they're big ones or not. Do not buy the fat cucumbers. Let's say they're per piece. If the food is being sold per piece, don't buy uh, the biggest, fattest one you can get. You want to buy the skinniest one. The skinniest one will have the smallest seeds in it and usually more concentration of flavor. Because let's say winter squash, the bigger it gets, the more seeds are in there, the more water is in, perhaps the less sweetness is in it. So I buy smaller vegetables oftentimes. So what I do, of course, I take off the end. And what we did for the salad is slice it in two or three, or, or actually three or four slabs. And then never cut a vegetable when it, on its rocky side. Turn it over. Come down like this. In this case, we're going to do three. Now, what you'll see, so the seeds in there, now these seeds are very tender and sweet, these, on these little Turkish cucumbers. But I've also learned, just like this part of the tomato, that slimy part of the tomato, if I leave the seed in, it will make the salad go bad quicker. Okay, so it, just take it out, and that way your salad will last longer. And then again, watch what I'm doing, tuck my fingers, back end of my knife, the front of my knife stays anchored on the board, and I pick up. Just pick up and down. You don't even have to glide. Just up and down is fine. And make sure you move your fingers backwards. Now look what happens when I get distracted and I'm not paying attention. My knuckles stop the knife. They can't cut my fingers. My knuckles are right there.
play with that later. Okay, just want to show you a few tricks, and that is with garlic. By the way, Pacific um, Health Foods had this, and I haven't seen braided garlic in a long time, and this is organic to boot. It was only $10, and I'm going to so enjoy using this. Probably for someone like me, would make sense for me to buy this much garlic. I don't know if that makes sense for you to buy this much garlic, but um, the worst that'll happen, I won't use it all and they'll dry up and it'll be fine. And I'll just hang them anyway. I have a fake one I bought from Mexico. Why not have a fresh one? You know, a ceramic one I bought in Mexico years ago. Uh, anyway, the easiest way to peel a garlic is to just take the garlic clove. I have to tell you a funny story. When I was only 13 years old, I was, I was kind of sort of in love, if you can call it love at 13, with an Italian boy. And uh, my mom's English. No one's, no ins I'm going to tell apologize ahead of time if you feel insulted. They overcook everything, okay? So my mom is English, she overcooks everything. She doesn't know how to make tomato sauce, spaghetti sauce very well. So I'm gonna learn how to make spaghetti sauce. I got no training in the kitchen, I just watched my mom. I guess I was fascinated with food at an early age. And I read the recipe and it called for three cloves of garlic. And I didn't know what a clove was. <laughs> guess what I thought it was? Three bulbs of garlic. You know how long it took me to peel three bulbs of garlic? And do you know what? It was fabulous tasting sauce. <laughs> so at that age, I think I decided at that age that you really can't screw up a recipe. Cooking can't be that hard, because if you screw up, it might actually be better than the original recipe. And no, there's no such thing as too much garlic. So that was my, I think that's what my decision was at 13, and maybe I wasn't afraid to become a chef. Anyway, put your knife over it and just slam it. Unless you need the garlic cloves whole for something, this will work perfect usually comes out of the skin just by one little shake. And then, of course, you can mince it or you can use a garlic, a garlic mincer or press. I only use something like this when I'm making a salad or I'm putting the garlic in some place raw. Then I, that, but if I'm going to put it in a soup, all I have to do is just coarsely chop it up because the soup will mellow it out. And I don't really have to put, uh, mix it up any more than that. I have to show you this because I, it's just too gorgeous. These are cauliflowers. They're in season right now. This is a purple cauliflower that turns an indigo. Some of you ladies have that beautiful indigo color on. That's the color it changes when it's cooked. This beautiful yellow one, and I, I adore this one as well. And I, don't, I think it's psychological because it doesn't taste that much different than the white. Can you call them up? Oh, sure. So we can see them OK. Um, my mother put butter on everything, God bless her, and that's part of the English thing too. That, her, her spices were salt, pepper, and butter. Swear to God, <laughs> swear to God. We had, I think, garlic, salt, or pepper, uh, garlic uh, powder in the house, but that was about it. Anyway, I love this, maybe because it looks like butter. <laughs> I, don't know. I don't know, but I like that one a lot. Um, then this is the Ruminesco. Can you see it okay in the mirror? Okay. Um, excuse me, this is the Ruminesco. Look at this beautiful one. Looks like those like a turban or something, a dancer, some kind of dancer. So this is, it's got very, very thick stems to it. It's a nuttier and chewier cauliflower. Uh, but I just adore it because it has more substance, it has more flavor to it than the white cauliflower that I'm used to. But I will take sometimes all five cauliflowers, because there's another one. There's one that's green like this, but it's not a Romanesco. This comes from a, play, a town in Italy called Ruminesco, and you'll have to correct me if I'm wrong, but that's what I've read if you've traveled in Italy. And I'll take these five cauliflowers, and I'll put in um, tossed um, oil and some fresh herbs and put it in the oven and roast them. And the concentration of the cauliflower taste is really what I like. I don't like them steamed. I don't like them sauteed. This one, when I first brought it home, I had a little one, and I showed it to my husband. I'd never seen it before. This is a couple years ago. They just started to grow these locally. And I said, my husband, isn't this beautiful? <laughs> he just, he humors me. <laughs> and I said to him, I want to eat this. Do you want to eat this now with me? And he, again, humored me. And all I did was steam it, put some butter and salt and pepper on it, just like, Mom, what if? And it was delicious. These here, I want to just show you, these are fresh from Farmer's Market this morning. I bought them, whoa. And these are all the zucchinis are just coming into season now. And what we did with our quesadilla is we just sliced up the zucchini 
and we roasted all the vegetables. We roasted the peppers, roasted the zucchinis, because we wanted to concentrate their flavors before we put it in the quesadilla. So I just wanted to show you the variety that's coming in. We have pepper in the quesadilla as well, and I want to tell you about pepper. This is not a bell pepper, but the red bell peppers, they're squattier, you know, the ones I'm talking about. They are a ripe green pepper. Many people, I guess if I ask, don't digest green pepper, don't eat green pepper. That's because it's actually rare, a raw. <laughs> it's not a ripe pepper, and maybe that's the reason why you have a difficult time digesting it. If you leave it on the vine long enough, it turns red. So it's not supposed to be green, it's supposed to be red. The yellow and the orange are a totally different variety altogether. So if you're gonna, how many of you grill? Okay, so I wanna just give you a little hint about grilling, because we're doing a grilling class right now at Santa Barbara City College. We do classes, um, Caneo Valley, Westlake, Let's Ed Cooking, Santa Barbara City College. I uh, was thinking about Carpinteria High School, we'll have to see. Well, anyway, for those who grill, this is how you want to prep your pepper. You want to take your knife down like this and go like that. Now, this is not waste. This is what's going to go in your salad. Just chop it up for something else. But because it's nice and flat, you'll be able to grill and get your grill marks on your pepper. Okay? Uh, let's see. Let's talk about our salad. Oh, by the way, you're getting, uh, I'll pass this around. You're getting lemon lavender tea. Oh, lemon lab lemonade, I should say, lavender lemonade up there. And this is French culinary lavender. Uh, it's not quite in season yet. In August is when they start harvesting in it. They harvest and they lay it out in the field to dry. So around August, September, and then the, for several months, you'll be able to actually buy the flowers themselves. You may have in your garden, how many have lavender in your garden? Is it the Spanish lavender that has the little... Uh, sort of bunny ears on it, the little purple flowers. That's a Spanish lavender that's not very good for culinary and it's not good for perfume, but it's, it's grown because it's prettier than the other ones. Uh, English lavender is stronger, so they use that more often in lotions and perfumes, and uh, lavender, French lavender is milder, and they use that for more culinary. You could literally buy the bunch of lavender when you see it at farmer's market and then just decorate your house and then when you want to just rub off some of the flowers. How you make the lemonade is that you make a simple syrup and what you do is you put in a tablespoon of lavender buds in a cup of sugar. Let that sit for about a half hour then pour boiling water over it and let that sit for about a half hour or longer. The longer you steep the stronger it will get. Then you strain out your lavender buds and you end up with what's called simple sugar that has a strong lavender flavor to it. Then you add that to lemons, lemonade, uh, lemon juice and water and you have your lemonade. Uh, our salad, I want to tell you about our salad. We have, we got a wonderful donation of this wonderful Bib Living Lettuce Salad. Now it's hydroponically grown so we don't really need to wash it because it's not grown in dirt. But I want to tell you something about how to prep salad. This, by the way, is my favorite salad spinner, and I wouldn't be without it. When you take salad off, whether it be romaine or whether it's um, iceberg, whatever you're doing, you don't want to do this, which I see people all the time, twisting your lettuce. Because each of the lettuce has, if you will, veins in them. Okay, they've got veins and it's got water in those veins. And if you twist it, you're actually tearing those veins and spilling the water into the other part of the lettuce. This will be black within a half hour. It'll look like it's a week old. Likewise, don't cut it. Your knife will oxidize the lettuce and brown the edges. So if you want to prepare lettuce for a couple of days, not have to do it every single day, you've got to gently tear it. The bottom usually I, I don't use. I'll do this, I snap it backwards. If this is too wide, I tear it, and guess what? It tears right along the line of the, the, the vein. And that way you don't have any of the lettuce stays wonderful for days. <clears throat> what we have also put, what we have also put in it, this is a chioka beet. Let me show you some of these wonderful beets. Oh, oh boy, <laughs> where are they? <laughs> right 
Are the beet tops edible? Yes. yes, they're wonderful. They're healthy for you. They're kind of like Swiss chard or beets. Actually, beets, Swiss chard, and um, spinach are all in the same family. Now, they are high in something called oxalic acid. So the only reason I'm telling you that is not bad for you, but it binds up with calcium and iron. So if your greenest green is spinach and you think you're good, you're not. So have other greens besides spinach, like kale and collard greens, mustard greens, turnip tops. All of those are very edible. Of course, Swiss chard. So you can use, I wouldn't use the stems, but I would take these off, throw out some of the ones that are nasty looking, saute with garlic and olive oil, and you have greens on the side. So I want to show you these. These are, uh, I don't have the red beets because you all know what that looks like. These are not the red beets. These are a beet called the chioga beet. A chioga comes from Italy also. I don't know where in Italy, but I heard it's someplace in Italy. And it's a peppermint beet. It's wonderful. What do I do with it? Oh, here it is. So I want to show you what it looks like. That's a terrible one. Hold on, hold on. I don't like that at all. That's a terrible one. Gosh. We, you'll see in your salad, it is very, very deep red. You never know when I get it unless I cut it there at the farmer. I don't know if it has to do with the amount of water they put in the soil or what, but sometimes it's incredibly deep pink and circles all the way through. These are not as, these are not as impressive. I'm going to talk to Underwood Farms about it. <laughs> but all you do is shave that. So here's the golden beets. Here's the golden one. You can eat beets raw. You don't have to cook them. But of course, you have to shave them pretty thin. There are two, uh, there's this slingshot style that I love. It's a slingshot style peeler. This is called a Kuhn. I only recommend that brand, K-U-H-N. You can get it Sur La Tabla, Williams Sonoma has it. And of course, you're gonna take the outside peel off the beet as well as with the chioga. And then all you have to do for your salad is just shave pieces of it in your salad. Okay, like that. This is no harder to eat than carrots are, raw carrots. So there's no reason why you can't eat it. Too much of the red one will bleed. It's got a lot of juice to it, tends to bleed, and it might make your salad a bit purple. Um, and here with the chioga as well. Just pieces like that. It's just really beautiful in the salad. And good for you, because beets are high in, high in iron as well. OK. So let's talk about ginger. I want to show you about ginger, and then we'll talk about carrots. And I think lunch is getting ready right now as we speak. Um, ginger, a lot of people love ginger. I'm one of them. But what we do, we don't actually go through all this problem uh, or, or a struggle of peeling it, slicing it, dicing, I don't do any of that. I buy, I have this all the time in my house and in my tool chest. I have, it's like a cheese grater, a uh, small hold, kind of meant for Parmesan. They're only about $3.50 each. You take the ginger, of course it's been washed, and you just grate it, skin and all. How many of you like ginger ale? You gotta make your own ginger ale. Much, much healthier for you. You don't have any of that garbage that's in there or sugars or whatever else that's in the ginger ale. It's very easy with a little ginger juice. Hardly a quart of a teaspoon of ginger juice and sparkling water with honey or agave or sugar, whatever you think you'd like, and you've got your own homemade ginger ale. It's not going to be golden colored like Canada Dry. But if you want to make it golden colored, you can put in a spice that doesn't have any flavor to it, but it will make it yellow. Anybody know what that is? Turmeric. So turmeric is a spice that's in curry. Curry is not a spice. Curry is a combination of spices. Curry can be 9 to 11 different spices or more. Some curry are very hot. Some, that's why you can go to different curries are very different in flavor. If you traveled in India, you would find many different curry combinations as the powder. Um, depending on where you shop, we have a shop up in Santa Barbara, Indochina, and the curry 
in the Cayenne is marked by BTUs, which stands for British Thermal Units. <laughs> it indicates how hot it is, so you have to be very careful with all that. But um, so do try. The most of the curry that you and I buy in stores is pretty average, mild. It's not so strong. But turmeric is what makes curry yellow. Otherwise, curry would be brownish color. So we're just going to grate it like this. Ready? Huge amount of juice. This, if it's fresh, if you've had it in the refrigerator for about a month and a half, I don't know. I'm not going to guarantee you it's going to have a lot of juice to it. When it starts to get rubbery, don't expect it to give you a lot of juice. Now, you've got some ginger and you've used it up and you, you're starting to think, OK, it's not, I'm not going to be able to use it up before it goes bad. Juice it all like this. Throw this in your ice cube tray. An empty ice cube, freeze little cubes of ginger juice. And then you can throw it in your soups, you can throw it in your tea, you can put it in uh, ginger ale, you can do all that kind of. This has actually got a lot of flavor still left in it. So if you have one of those tea infusers, you could put this in one of those, hot boiling water with some lemon and honey, fantastic tea. Ginger is good for circulation, it's good for nausea, it's good for uh, digestion. It's a wonderful herb to put in your diet, way beyond just the, the stir fries. Now, what else is in this salad? I'm running back and forth, but I'm seeing things I haven't shown with you yet. This is amaranth. Amaranth is a grain, actually, that is grown in many parts of the world. And in many third world countries, amaranth is a necessary grain for survival, one of the biggest sources of protein for many, many cultures. But way before it goes to seed to give you a grain, it's this, this gorgeous, this is one of the varieties, Gorgeous purple color. Um, I'm finding that Asian farmers at the farmer's markets are the ones that tend to be growing this. Uh, but we put a little bit in your salad, so hopefully you got a salad with a little amaranth. It tastes like spinach. It may look a little bit scary, but it, it's beautiful and it tastes like spinach. So why not put it very, very high in iron? Speaking of high in iron, we have kale. Number one vegetable. If there is one vegetable in North America that is most nutritious for you, that is kale. Not anything more uh, than that. It has iron and calcium in it, all the B vitamins, uh, vitamin D, vitamin A, vitamin K in it. They're wonderful. Lately, a lot of people are making salads out of them. You can buy, this was at uh, Pacific uh, Health Food Store, Kale Joy, this is, says must eat mesquite. So what they're doing is they're putting a wonderful um, topping on it, working it in and drawing it up. This is the best chip that you could eat. So if you're one of those crunchers that loves salty things, you must try kale chips. Go to my blog at suzannelandry.com and you will see a recipe for cheesy kale chips. I also have a YouTube channel. It's called The Passionate Vegetable. There's about 30, I think. I have to check with Joseph. I think we have 30 uh, little YouTube uh, three minutes, five minutes little tutorials to teach you a lot of what I've just shown you if you want to share it with loved ones or friends. Um, but anyway, kale is wonderfully either raw salads or uh, this is a curly leaf kale. It's actually called red Russian curly leaf. This is called Tuscan kale or dinosaur kale for obvious reasons because of the the dinosaur looking leaves. This one, you could literally, uh, of course, wash it, dry it, brush it with olive oil, put a little bit of salt in it, lay it on a cookie sheet with parchment paper, 200 degrees for two hours, and it will dry up. It actually, if you have a wolf or a big stove like a Viking or wolf, do not do it two hours. It'll be 45 minutes in your stove. But a regular stove, I have a regular stove at home, or an oven at home, 200 degrees, two hours. It dries it up into this crunchy, salty chip that's delicious. Um, so do try kale any way that you can. And then we have carrots. So guess what? This is not the original carrot, not at all. This is a hybrid. And we didn't hybridize carrots until 1890. So before 1890, 
These varieties and many more were called carrots. This is a, like a purple uh, carrot with a purple inside. Some of them, they're almost black on the outside with orange inside or yellow inside. These I've seen yellow, these I've seen almost white, and they're all varieties of heirloom carrots. These are carrots that have been around. This way? Okay, sorry. This, they needed to make this mirror just a tad bit wider. Anyway, so these are all the heirloom carrots that have been around for hundreds of years. In Celtic, the word carrot means honey underground. So this is why, you know, this was uh, what they did is they crossed a dark variety with a yellow variety and got this variety. This is sweeter, this is more watery, together it made a better carrot. And the, I, I don't know if you can believe anything on the internet, but the story goes that in 1890, the queen of, uh, I think it was Austria, declared that this henceforth would, henceforth would be called a carrot because it matched her coat of arms, just like a woman, right? But anyway, do try them. What I do with these is I will matchstick them. And oh, by the way, two things. Baby carrots are not baby carrots. When they harvest the carrots, often they get broken. And while they're broken, it used to be the farmers used to try to sell those carrots to pig farmers and get rid of them. 400 pounds a week, uh, as one of the farmers was telling me, he had as waste. And then once somebody had the brilliant idea, actually it was a guy, it was a farmer in Bakersfield, decided to, to shave them down. He borrowed somebody's apple peeler and he shaved the carrots down to shape them into mini carrots. And he put them out on his farm stand and they were an instant hit. That was back in 1987, and it has now baby carrots surpassed the sale of regular carrots by 76%. Sadly for me, because baby carrots are one-tenth the nutritional value of these carrots. And the reason for it is carrots grow like trees. The majority of the nutrition is in the peel and right behind the peel. So I never peel my carrots. I'll take a scrub brush and scrub it if it's dirty, and that's it. I'll leave it like that. Um, when you get this home, when I buy carrots with the tops, I want the carrots to stay on. When I, I buy it like this, and then I bring it home, and then I take the carrot tops off. And the reason for it is from the carrot's point of view, what's the most important part of this carrot is this. This is a lowly root. Its whole purpose in life is to bring water and minerals and vitamins from the soil, like any other root, and try to keep the plant alive. Likewise, this is very nutritious for you, also super bitter. I, I eat maybe, I'll put two or three of these like this, just the top parts in my juice, but that's about it. Um, I don't use a lot of it, but it is very good for you. Vitamin A, vitamin K, also calcium, lots of iron. However, if I leave this together and keep it in the refrigerator, then the next day I will find it to be rubbery. Like I left these in the refrigerator so I could show them to today, but I ran to farmer's market this morning and got these, and these are much different because these were picked probably yet, probably this morning. So do take it off, keep this separate if you're gonna to try to use them and keep them and they're good. Don't cut it up here either. You wanna literally break it right here. If you leave that on there, the plant will still try to grow uh, the leaves. And we could probably match, show you how to match stick, but I think we're out of time. We are out of time, yes? Um, here's what's going to happen now. We're going to have questions and answers from Susan. So if you have a question, we're going to start with that. The second part of this is we're going to serve you today. So all the cooks are lining up the various dishes on plate, and then we're going to bring them around to you. And so I, if you want to stretch or get some more liquid, that's fine. But let's do the Q&A first. And do you know what you're having? Do you know what your meal is, your menu? Susan? Uh, California Fiesta quinoa salad, which is by far the most popular salad I've ever made. I created it when I first came to California, inspired by the southwestern flavors we have here. It's a bit challenging to make it volume for 65, 75 people. <laughs> But that's, and then we're doing a farmer's market quesadilla, which would be vegetables and cheese and a quesadilla with the avocado salsa on top. Um, 
and then we're having a fresh garden salad with all these wonderful <coughs> salads as well. We're doing chocolate dipped strawberries for dessert as well. There are two things I have to show you, I must do this. So no <laughs> Q&A until I'm done. <laughs> so, have to show you, this is more important than anything I just showed you. If you don't want to cry and you like onions, soak your onion for 10 minutes in water. Hot or cold, it doesn't matter. When you cut your onion, you will not cry, okay? That's worth the whole admission of $5. <laughs> All right, so one other thing. This is called the root end. You don't want to cut way back here. You want to cut right behind the root end and then over here. Then you put your knife underneath the skin and you pull up. Because it's wet, it should come off in nice big pieces. Now you're going to slice it right in the middle, right in that root end, because the root end is going to help hold it together. If I want to dice for soup, turn it. We have dice pieces for soup. If I want to mince, or let's say not mincing, let's say I want to do wedges of onion for a roasted vegetable dish, because I've left the root end on, I cut making sure I keep some of that root end on. So it holds together, it helps hold the wedge together. Otherwise it'll unravel and you'll have burned onion. If you want to mince it, you put your knife into the onion, very thin, tiny, quarter of an inch slices, up to but not through that root end. So essentially the root end has held this together. Then you turn it and do very, very small cuts. You basically have tiny little mince pieces of onions. Much quicker to do onion that way. And last but not least, the avocado. Put your knife in, turn it on its side, and roll the avocado into the knife, okay? Then just hold one edge and open up your knife. Hold it and just smack the nut and turn it and lift it out. How do you take uh, wedges out? Let's say if you're doing tacos, very gently slice into the avocado, and then take your spoon and lift out your slices. If you don't want slices and you want cubes, as we did for our avocado salsa, slice it, then turn it this way and slice it into cubes, and do that, okay? Very easy. And um, I'm done, I promise, I'm done, thank you.